Okay, if everybody could come in, that would be great, and sit down and be quiet and make sure your devices have all been silenced because we have another wonderful set of treats here. I think, honestly, if I'd been organizing a conference, I would have had it be a three-day conference with all this richness of people and participants and interactions and information. But anyway, we are so blessed to have so many wonderful people here in town together. Thank you for all quietening down so we can hear the next great panel. I'm Helena Cobbin. I'm the CEO of a company called Just World Books that um, was was founded by myself with the goal of expanding the discourse in this country on issues of vital global concern. And as it happens, most of our books recently have been about Palestine, including this fabulous title by Nora Barrows Friedman, which speaks directly to the experiences that you're going to hear in person from Ahmed, Amani, and Dima right now. This book and many other fine books are available for sale at the um, WRMEA book stand, which also has olive oil and Palestinian tchotchkes and all kinds of wonderful things. So I urge you to support them by going and buying all those great products. That's the commercial interlude from me. Um, we've, we're going to start with Amani El... Khatatbi, who is the founding editor-in-chief of MuslimGirl.net, a blog aimed at eliminating stereotypes surrounding Islam and promoting the place of Muslim women in Western society. Amani, by the way, in case you didn't know, this whole panel is about what's happening on the college campuses these days, which is absolutely crucial to the future of this issue. So that's why it's particularly great to have this youthful energy here. Um, and it comes with a, an enormous amount of experience of organizing on campuses. So Amani ran into trouble with Rutgers University trustees and its daily newspaper, the Daily Targum, um, which decided that criticism of Israel is anti-Semitic. In June 2012, the ADC named Khatatbi its media relations specialist. So we're delighted to hear first and foremost from Amani El Khatatbi. Good morning, slash almost afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm really honored to be opening up this panel. It is definitely crucial to the conversation surrounding how we're going to be talking about Israel and Palestine and how we're going to shape politics in the future. So I'm excited to have this panel here and I thank the organizers for allowing, this, uh, allowing us this opportunity to speak on these topics with such a distinguished audience and amongst such amazing speakers that all of us have been referencing all throughout college for the work that we've done. So. I want to start out by posing a question to the room. I want to hear your thoughts, your opinions. I want to bring up um, this column. That just went away completely. <laughs> Someone can help me with this, please. Thank you. OK. Until it comes back up on the screen behind me, I want to read aloud what it says. It's a column that was published in the Daily Targum, Rutgers University's uh, student newspaper. And it was um, written in criticism of a new building that Hillel was uh, raising funds for on our campus. They had a huge, a huge building in the center of our university, and they were raising funds to make an even bigger one um, to be able to provide even more services to the campus community. This article was published around that time. It's called, Can Hillel's Funding Be Put to Better Use Elsewhere? In the column, Colleen Jolly, the writer, says, if you know anything about Israel, you can conclude that pro-Israel parties are good at getting money into funds, i.e. the purchases of Jewish National Fund and modern day Palestine. On December 2nd, the Jewish Federation of Greater Middlesex County, where Rutgers University is situated, a federally and privately funded agency raised $400,000 at a telefund held at the Douglas Campus Center. 
I'm not 100% sure where this money is going, but seeing that they use the university building, my only guess would be that the university, or specifically to the uh, proposed Hillel building. This building is to be named after Eva and Ari Helbum. So Colleen brought up an interesting point, right? Her column didn't take into account how that money was being accrued or the fact that Hillel's building was being privately funded, but it brought up some links that she saw with pro-Israel organizations and parties across the country, or what she viewed as her own experiences with them. Now, does this column have anti-Semitic undertones? Do you think so? Okay. I wanna keep that in mind as we look at this next column. Now, Colleen Jolly was a student this column was published by the same newspaper, Rutgers Daily Paper, by um, a man who actually has a position, an official position as a rabbi at Hillel on campus. Um, and this was published a few years prior. It was during the uproar around Op Operation Cast Blood. So Rabbi Weiss says, standing on the steps of Brower Commons on College Avenue campus, they held a vigil for, referring to uh, an organization that later became known as SJP on campus, the 1,400 lives lost during the war in Gaza more than two years ago, the Daily Targum reported, yet students and staff who came for the, for the ambiance of a peaceful vigil that night may not have known that they were involved in a vigil which mourned the deaths of terrorists. Included in the number of victims being mourned were a whopping 600 to 700 Hamas terrorist operatives that were also killed in the Gaza war. Student groups paying homage to known terrorists fuels fear, hatred, resentment, and divides our campus community. This kind of activity is much more common on more hostile and radically charged campuses. University students were exposed to paying tribute to fallen terrorists under the guise of innocent civilians. Now, does this column seem racist? Right? I mean, I, I'm not going to bring up anti-Semitism and how it also applies to Arabs and how this could be applicable as anti-Semitism. But it's interesting that this column received an entire uproar. I actually published this column. I was the, the opinions editor of the student newspaper at the time. And this came to my desk, and I decided to run with it. We edited it. It was much more offensive before, before we decided to publish it. But I and several other editors went through the, edit, the editing process with it went forward with it because I felt like there were much worse things published in this newspaper before for, uh, for other groups, right? And if we're going to be boasting about freedom of speech in our college newspaper, it should apply to all types of uh, columns that we receive and it shouldn't be filtered based on who we're talking about. But this op-ed turned out to be the one that launched a thousand other op-eds and this was the result. This was a public statement issued by the editor-in-chief, who was my boss at the time. Um, and this, was, this decision was made completely without my consideration at all, even though I was the editor of that page. And in it, he says, um, basically, that they had decided to take down the article. And looking back, elements in that piece really discriminatory undertones that do not reflect the values and goals of our organization. These elements, which I personally find distasteful and irrelevant, greatly overshadow any sort of argument the author was trying to make. So what happened was, as a result of that um, op-ed by Colleen Jolly about Hillel's building, a series of actions were taken by the newspaper that were not taken when it came to the way that the newspaper published articles about other entities, other parties in this conversation on Israel and Palestine, they removed Colleen Jolly's column from the, from the website completely, which is almost unheard of. They even issued a, a, a retraction in the um, corrections of the printed newspaper the following week. They released a public statement, which takes a lot to get from our editorial staff at the Targum. And on top of that, something that happens behind the scenes that didn't receive much visibility at all by the pressure of Hillel around this column, they were able to get the Board of Trustees to implement sensitivity training to every incoming editor on how to, to, to identify anti-Semitic undertones in columns that they're editing. 
And then, on top of that, in case you thought that wasn't enough, they also decided, the Board of Trustees told the editorial staff that from that year forth, any, any column or, or a letter to the editor, anything that was submitted to them that was on Israel or Palestine had to go straight to the Board of Trustees for their approval. Now, number one, I'm pretty sure that's literally the definition of censorship, if you want to open it up in a dictionary. Um, but number two, if we're talking about anti-Semitism, and that was the charge, what in the world does that have to do with the Israel-Palestine conflict? This really powerful, influential organization on campus, Hillel, basically used this opportunity and this uproar around this column to create more pressure on the newspaper to censor itself on Israel, because pro-Palestine sentiment on campus was gaining a lot of traction. It certainly did when I assumed office. I became the first Palestinian opinions editor that the newspaper had in its history, and we're talking about the oldest collegiate paper since the United States became the United States. I was also the only Arab editor for my entire editorial staff, so I guess that was kind of, you know, a, a sensitive thing in the office. And on top of that, I was told by um, people that had worked there before that I was the first hijab-wearing Muslim woman that they had as an editor in the newspaper as well. So when I assumed my, my position, what exactly was I coming into? When I was a freshman at Rutgers, um, the newspaper had a really awful, awful reputation for being very pro-Israel, very slanted. The opinions page only showed these really strong um, columns, like the one you saw from Rabbi Weiss, um, that were very distorted and showed only one side, one, one point of view to things. Um, and there was a lot of controversy on campus even then. So these are statistics that were put together by students and faculty alike. They went back through an entire um, year to two year span in the newspaper of the opinions page before I assumed office. This was two years before I, I um, got into, my, into the, got, received my desk as the opinions editor. And they put together how many opinions articles were exactly published that were pro-Palestine, how many were published that were pro-Israel, and how many were neutral. And as you can see, there are almost twice as many uh, op-eds published that were pro-Israel than pro-Palestine. So this is what I was dealing with. And honestly, this was a huge motivation for me when I got invited to, to apply for the position because I was like, wow, this is something that I've been wanting to change since I was a freshman. So now I'm a junior, why not, right? So I went for it and I, I got elected for the position. And lo and behold, immediately, Literally, my first month in office, this was probably even the first week of me being the opinions editor, I was charged with bias, immediately. Um, literally, one of the first op-eds that I published was submitted by a Hillel member on campus. And it was about Iran um, and Israel, uh, Israel's interests in um, US policies in Iran, why the US should be against Iran, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and the editorial process, like I, said, like I mentioned earlier, goes through a series of editors. So this particular um, column received the exact same treatment any other column did. We put it through the editorial process, fact-checked it, we, changed, we edited it for length so it can fit into the paper so that we can even publish it in the first place. But immediately that student and other really influential and vocal members of Hillel made a very public uh, complaint against me that I was biased. And I'm not entirely sure that I would have been accused of that had I been any other identity than an Arab Muslim woman in that position. So things started really heating up with, when it came to Targum on campus. I was under a lot of scrutiny. The spotlight was literally on me for what was being published, how it was being published, and the treatment that the op-eds were receiving. One Hillel member who had the position of being the, the Israel chair, so I'm, I'm assuming his position has something to do with promoting pro-Israel relations on campus or something, he actually started an entire blog dedicated to me and started um, having Hillel members that submitted op-eds also submit those same op-eds to him. And then he, would, he made a blog where he would show what the original version was and what the edited version looks like. And then any edits that were made that weren't always, weren't always mine, but they were pretty typical, uh, very, very usual edits, uh, he would politicize them and attribute some great underlying intention behind it. 
and really, you know, trying to rub up the sentiment around me that I'm like this biased, unreliable editor and I shouldn't be in my position. And interestingly enough, no other editor in our staff received that same type of treatment, that same type of scrutiny. No one else was really um, considered for whether they're approaching a topic sensitively or not. Now, as a result, I, for a, no a number of times throughout my term, was threatened, I was threatened by, um, for termination by the Board of Trustees. What wasn't disclosed is that one member of the Board of Trustees is actually the mother of one of the leading officials of Hillel entirely. And that was something that they kept secret from us. So obviously, things already behind the scenes are politicized. And the, the very close ties the Board of Trustees had with Hillel, they used that to try and increase pressure on me to decide what my editorial decisions were. Things really popped off when I published an op-ed that was pro-Palestine, um, because we had published one that was pro-Israel the day before. And when I pub published the pro-Palestine one, I got accused by, every, that was probably the popping off point where everyone really attacked me for being biased. The, um, that particular uh, official in Hillel, whose mother was on the board, she said that she had submitted a letter and I hadn't picked hers over the pro-Palestine one and I should because she's an official Hillel uh, official, even though a pro-Palestine letter was published before hers. Um, and they wanted to create a rule where anytime a pro-Palestine letter was published, a pro-Israel letter had to be published alongside it a major double standard because countless pro-Israel pro letters were published without any kind of consideration towards the opposing side. So they were telling the Board of Trustees, we have to tell, we have to tell this editor, you know, she has to publish Hillel letters on Monday because that's when the newspaper gets the most circulation. She has to publish pro-Israel letters alongside pro-Palestine letters. And multiple times they told me if I didn't do exactly what they said, they were going to fire me. So I had many opportunities to expose what was happening behind the scenes, but this is an issue that I think Dima is going to speak a lot for um, with students on college campuses, is that they're in a very vulnerable position. So for me, I had to risk losing my job, which was my paycheck. I had to risk a, a reputation in my school for being an editor if I got fired or if I got terminated. Um, and I was really confused because also when I reached out to the Board of Trustees before I realized this was all happening coming from them, I, I expressed my concerns that I was being discriminated against. And they, re, they responded to me by saying, um, basically that I'm the one that should be worried, that I'm the one that, is, that they're, they're concerned with about bias, that I'm the one that um, is the problem. So I started also wondering, like, wait, am I doing something wrong? And then this was compiled. Same survey that was conducted years before I became the opinions editor. They conducted the same one for my term exactly. The, the op-eds that were published pro-Palestine and pro-Israel and neutrally on this topic during my term. And they found that, again, even with a Palestinian Muslim Arab woman as the opinions editor, there were still almost twice as many pro-Israel letters published during my term than pro-Palestine letters. But this is something that all the blogs and newspapers that were writing about this issue, it was something that they never uh, considered or covered in any of their coverage, which I think speaks a lot to it. So for the end of my term, every editor gets the privilege of having a farewell column. That's their opportunity to you know, talk very, uh, very, very emotionally about how much the Targum gave back to them, what they learned from their experience, et cetera. So, I finally had made it. I was at the finish line. I was like, yes, I didn't get fired. I survived, you know? So I was like, this is the perfect opportunity for me to tell other students what exactly is happening behind the scenes. This is what I experienced. So I wrote up an entire column, basically detailing exactly what happened from A to Z. And my own editorial staff censored me. I didn't even have to rely on the Board of Trustees anymore. My own co-editors who witnessed everything that was happening, they told me, no, we can't publish this because it's going to make our newspaper look bad. <laughs> so I was like, all right, you're going to censor me. I'm going to go to the Huffington Post. And then the Huffington Post decided to publish it. Now, this was my first time writing for a, a major publication like this, and I was very relieved because 
I was almost in tears when they were centering me. I was like, wow, this is literally happening again, even as I'm about to leave. But thankfully, it turned out for the better because this issue ended up receiving a national audience. And it getting published in the Huffington Post is even the reason why I'm here today. The ADC, the American Arab Anti-Discrimination Committee, it's the largest civil rights organization in the country for Arab Americans. They saw this and they reached out to me because they felt like I was being discriminated against. And then only a couple of months later, when I was about to graduate from college, they reached out to me and recruited me to be their media relations specialist. And now I'm in DC where these decisions are happening. Now, my time is up, so I just want to wrap up with this HuffPo article came out with, uh, it was followed up by the Foundation for Individual Rights of Education. Um, they wrote a blog about it, and in the blog they said, Targum readers think that they are getting news on controversial topics from independent student editors, but instead they seem to be getting the perspective of unknown members of a board of trustees working behind the scenes. Now, if college campuses are a microcosm of society, I hope that everyone keeps this in mind when we think about what's really happening with our news today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Amani. It really is wonderful for me to be here with three amazingly talented young Palestinian Americans. That's such, like, you know, when I came to this country 30 years ago, it was very different. And here we see leadership being formed amongst a new generation of Palestinian Americans. 